you for much. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Faculty of Maths and Physics and Maths and Physical Sciences um, for allowing me to be here, the organisers for sorting everything out, um, the judging panel and you to come to listen. So I'm going to talk about um, my research which is looking at visceral to the crowd protection. So to give you a bit of background, um, these are the kinds of things that this is uh, worth about from um, my research group, so the Dugan research group. Sorry, that was really annoying. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we looked at. Um, so water uh, solutions, proteins, that's um, very important for us. So what we're doing is we're using physics tools to study uh, molecular and nanoscale information regarding biological uh, systems. So, uh, okay, cool. So, um, we all know that temperature controls how quickly something's going to happen. So, if you're making jelly, you use boiling water because it will mix more efficiently if the water is boiling. If you want to keep your food, or in this case, the Kali freezers, nice and fresh, you put them in the fridge because that slows down the reactions that causes them to go off. So, in a similar way, we can use this to keep biological samples viable. So it's exactly the same motivation for why here this is uh, a sperm sample going to liquid nitrogen. So crowd protection slows down the reactions that cause things to spoil. But cooling can also have problems. So as anyone who's walking in this morning will know, cold temperatures can lead to ice formation. Um, ice formation can also damage cells. So just in the same way that here you've got ice in a water pipe that's caused it to crack. You don't want that to happen in a biological cell and have everything and no longer have a cell wall so the cell is no longer viable. So how do we go about stopping these problems? So like with many um, questions in science, evolution's already found an answer, so we're just going to copy that. Um, so this is um, a water bear which can survive in space and amazing. Um, but the, it can deal with very it can deal very well with dehydration. And the way it does that is it accumulates things called cryoprotectants, such as glycerol. Uh, so this is an image of a uh, glycerol molecule, and it's that that I'm going to look at. Okay? So the theory, there's a bunch of theories for how glycerol manages to do this. So does it somehow change what the water is doing by changing its bonding or its structure? So I'm going to test these theories, and the way I'm going to test them is using neutron diffraction. So to understand what diffraction is, it's very much like the start of a rugby match, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but the kicker will bounce the ball on the ground to test how flat the ground is. So what they're doing there is they're looking to see the change in angle from when they throw the ball down and after it's interacted with the ground, and that tells them about the structure of the ground. And exactly the same way, I use neutrons to probe molecules. So I, the, the neutron hits the molecule and it's the angle that it comes off at that tells me about the structure of the molecules. So, as I said, I use neutrons, and I'm not allowed to do that here. Apparently, there's some health problems. Um, so, we go down to ISIS, which is um, a neutron source in Oxfordshire, so it's near Big Top. Um, a main reason for using neutrons to do my experiments with is I can get information about the structure, particularly regarding the hydrogen atoms, which is a key advantage of using neutrons over other probes. So, uh, this is the freezing temperature. This is uh, the freezing temperature of glycerol and water mixtures as a function of glycerol concentration. So the far right is pure glycerol and that uh, will freeze at about 18 degrees cent, uh, Celsius. Um, so what experiments have we done? I've done a large range of different experiments at different concentrations and at different temperatures. So this allows me to probe what happens when you change the amount of glycerol or the temperature of the system. So let's go back to theory one, which is that somehow glycerol changes the structure of water. But before I talk about that, I need to talk about what I mean by the structure of a liquid. So this is not a liquid, this is a schematic of a crystal. And what I'm showing here is that you have a repeating um, structure. So once you know what this box looks like, you know what the whole crystal looks like if it's a perfect crystal. Whereas with a liquid, you don't have this. You don't have this long range order anymore. So what we have to do is sit on a central particle Divide the area around that into slices a bit like an onion and count how many atoms there are in each of those slices as we move out radially. We then move on to the next particle, do the same thing again, and once we've done that for all of them, we can take an average 
and we call this average a radial distribution function. So this tells us about the structure of a liquid. Okay? So this is the data that you get from pure water. So what happens when we add in some glycerol? Not very much. So it's not that glycerol is changing the water structure dramatically. So what about the idea that um, glycerol is changing the ability of water to form bonds? So again, we can use our radial distribution function to tell us about the bonding. So a nice peak here tells you that there's some structure between two molecules. Okay? And we can count how many of these bonds there are by going back to our image and just counting how many particles there are in that circle. Okay? So we compare what we get for pure water with what we get with water in a glycerol water mixture, and you can see that the two bars are the same size. So glycerol isn't stopping water from forming hydrogen bonds. So it's neither of these two theories. What have we found? Okay, so if you look at um, the important ones here are the 0 0.50 and 0 0.25. So these are middling concentrations. And as you can see, that the, you should hopefully be able to see, uh, so that there's the glycerol, which is the grey spheres, and the water, which is the red sphere, are very well mixed at those concentrations. So you don't have large clusters of the same type of molecule altogether. So the argument then is that this works a little bit like an ice cream maker. So when you're, make, when you're using an ice cream maker, you need to continually stir the ingredients to stop getting pools of water which form ice. So what I'm saying is that glycerol is having the same effect by stopping the pools of water and stopping the ice formation. So if you've had ice cream that's come out of the freezer and then gone back in and then you've eaten it, after it's melted, it's kind of bitty because you haven't controlled where the water is when you've refrozen the ice cream. So, to sum up, I've got a new theory for why glycerol acts as a cryotactive uh, agent, and it's that the mixing prevents the ice formation. Okay, so, you know, that's fine, but what does that actually really mean? So, from, um, from a scientific point of view, from a physical chemistry point of view, this is interesting because it's an interesting uh, solution to have a look at. Um, but also, the point is that we need to get this information out to people who don't just look at solution chemistry and physical chemistry all the time. So this is a meeting of the Society for Low Temperature Biology. I'm not sure if you can see, but I'm probably wearing exactly the same outfit on the back row there. Um, I've got one suit. Um, but the point is there that I'm talking to people who don't have the tools to access this molecular scale information. They use trial and error to improve the way that they store biological things. And with an increased understanding of what's happening at a molecular level, that should help them to improve the protocols that they use. Um, this research has also been um, highlighted in, uh, for the top left is a magazine for high school students. Top right is the IC, so the place where I do my um, experiments, that's their yearly report. I've been in the Asprey Centre for Structural Biology year report as well, which is important because these biologists are using glycerol all the time because it works. And there isn't a thorough understanding of why it works, it's just used because it works. So I'm helping to give information for why it might be working. And the bottom right is the Society for the Temperature Biology I spoke about before. So I'd like to end by thanking the other members of the Dugan group. Uh, and the people at the ICS Neutron Source, uh, particularly Alan, Sylvia and Rowan, and you for listening. Thank you very much.